I'd like to share with you something from one of my favorite books. It's called The Horse and His Boy. It's book number two from the Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis. In the portion of the book that I'm about to read to you, the setting is uh, a warm and cozy dwelling place of a hermit in the middle of the woods. And inside that compound, there's a courtyard that's surrounded by tall green walls that are made of stone and covered in moss and vegetation. And inside that courtyard, there are three characters that have gotten to know each other pretty well. They've been through a lot in the previous parts of the story. Two of them are talking horses from Narnia. The first horse is a strong male horse. His name is Bree, and Bree is very pompous and very haughty. The other horse is a female horse. Her name is Huynh, and she is very humble and very wise. And apart from the two horses, there's a young girl named Arvis. Now, Arvis is not from Narnia, and so she knows nothing of Narnian ways. There's also a fourth character that comes into play, and his name is Aslan. Aslan is a great lion who is written by Lewis into the story to directly represent the character of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the story, Aslan is described as the son of the emperor over the sea, the great high king over all kings in Narnia. Now, if we go back to the two horses and the young girl, they're all three having a conversation in the middle of the courtyard. And when we join up with them in the story, Bree has something to say. When I speak of the lion, of course I mean Aslan, the great defender of Narnia, who drove away the witch in the winter. All Narnians swear by him. But is he a lion? <laughs> no, no, of course not said Bree, in a rather shocked voice. All the stories about him in Tashban say that he is, replied Aravis. And if he isn't a lion, why do you call him a lion? Well, you'd hardly understand that at your age, said Bree. And I was only a little foal when I left, so I don't quite fully understand it myself. Bree was standing with his back, to the green wall while he said this, and the other two were facing him. He was talking in a rather superior tone, with his eyes half shut. That was why he didn't see the changed expression in the faces of Huynh and Aravis. They had good reason to have open mouths and staring eyes, because while Bree spoke, they saw an enormous lion leap up from outside and balance itself on top of the green wall. Only, it was a brighter yellow, and it was bigger and more beautiful and more alarming than any lion they had ever seen. And at once, it jumped down inside the wall and began approaching Bree from behind. It made no noise at all, and Huynh and Aravis couldn't make any noise themselves, no more than if they were frozen. No doubt, continued Bree, when they speak of him as... A lion, they only mean he's mm, as strong as a lion, or, to our enemies, of course, as fierce as a lion, or something of that kind. Even a little girl like you, Aravis, must see that it would be quite absurd to suppose that he's a real lion. <laughs> Indeed, it would be disrespectful. If he was a lion, he'd have to be a beast, just like the rest of us. <laughs> Why, <laughs> And here, Bree began to laugh. If he was a lion, he'd have four paws and a tail and, and, and whiskers. <laughs> For just as he said the word whiskers, one of Aslan's had actually tickled his ear. Bree shot away like an arrow to the other side of the enclosure. And there he turned. The wall was too high for him to jump, and he could fly no farther. Aravis and Huynh both started back. There was about a second of intense silence. Then Huynh, though shaking all over, gave a strange little neigh and trotted across to the lion. 
Please, she said, you are so beautiful. You may eat me if you like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. I'll read that last statement again. You are so beautiful. You may eat me if you like. I would sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. What I've just read for you is not the Word of God. It's the Word of C.S. Lewis. But it points directly to a sentiment that is clearly laid out in the Bible. And I want to share that with you now. You'll find it in Psalm chapter 84, verse 10. A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. These two sentences are expressing the same main idea in two different ways. So we're going to combine these two sentences into one and shuffle the words around a little so that we can see it as one continuous thought. If we do that, here's what it looks like. I would rather spend one day as a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell a thousand days elsewhere, even in the tents of wickedness. Now let's break down a few of the key phrases. The psalm was originally written in the Hebrew language, where the phrase to be a doorkeeper is a verb that means to stand at the threshold. So when the writer talks about standing at the threshold of the house of God, he's not even going inside to enjoy the feast. Some scholars interpret this phrase to be a doorkeeper, meaning to guard the door. But other scholars interpret the phrase to lie as a beggar at the entrance. So if we insert that interpretation, the first clause reads like this. I would rather spend one day lying as a beggar at the entrance of the house of my God. The next clause uses the word dwell, which is our English translation of the Hebrew word that means to heap up, like to pile up the days by the thousands. It means you're not going anywhere. And it talks about dwelling among the wicked. All throughout the Psalms, wickedness is described in different ways, but one of the most prominent is to describe the delights of wickedness, the arrogance and the pride and the boasting, the exalting of our desires. The Psalms equate wickedness with prosperity, with eating delicacies and the easy life, a life with no accountability to God. So if we swap in those interpretations, the second clause reads like this then heap up thousands of days living in ease and luxury with no accountability. When we put it all together, our paraphrase of Psalm 84.10 reads like this. I would rather spend one day lying as a beggar at the entrance of the house of my God and then have my life be over, then heap up thousands of days a lifetime living in ease and luxury with no accountability. We know that through Jesus, we have an invitation to go past the threshold and into the very house of God to join him at his feast, not as invited guests, but as his dearly beloved children. But listen to what the psalmist is saying here. What he's saying is that even if that weren't true, even if I never made it past the threshold, even if I never had an opportunity to come into the house and experience nearness to God, it would still be a better use of my life to lay there at the threshold for one day, 24 hours, and then just stop existing afterwards. Even that would be a better use of me than an entire lifetime spent in prosperity and privilege and luxury anywhere else. And that reminds me of the words of Huynh, the humble and wise servant of Aslan, when she said to him this, You are so beautiful. 
you may eat me if you like, because I'd sooner be eaten by you than be fed by anyone else.